yeah so so yeah so we'll we'll talk about uh, de-risking business model see we have built we have built the business model now right so we have gone through various stages we have looked at value proposition we looked at value creation value delivery value capture and all these aspects of business model so finding a business model that works is a search problem because we have we will be in this loop of iterative loop of trying to find the right business model okay so this is a, this is absolutely a search a search problem for the early stages okay it's not an execution problem the execution happens when you find a product market fit and you go into what we call as the growth stage okay so you are still in a stage where you're trying to find the right uh, business model okay so while you have filled in all the nine blocks okay you know we have we have let, let me revisit this one more time okay and see what these nine blocks are and what is the value that we are getting and how our course is helping you get there so if you see this you know we spoke a lot about segments in value proposition and then uh, you know we had this uh, talk on market sizing like tam sam som okay so that is what we try to uh, deal with so that is all covered okay we spoke about how you create your value proposition statement and we asked you to create your elevator pitches and we also asked you to create your taglines <clears throat> so that's a value proposition then the channels so, okay so we will have a session coming up uh, very soon which is on go to market strategies okay what are the right channels to use okay how many channels to use you know how to find your channel profitability and all that kind of stuff okay so so this is this is this is, this will be one full session i think i think samir ketkar uh, we are requesting him to see if he can conduct that for us then comes customer relationship this is all about your customer success right you have acquired a customer you want to retain that customer and you want to upsell cross sell to that customer so that's customer success then this is the one word that all your investors will talk about what's your traction okay so all that they want to see is you know where are you in your revenue cycle okay so it does not mean that you you need to show them dollars not at all okay all that you need to show is you know there is a way for me to me to make money i figured out the pricing model okay i'm not there yet but i'm trying to like like for example in the case of uh, uh, event beep you know they they will create a derivative asset right of the people uh, who are there on that platform and they will try to monetize that okay so even if you are on track to create significant amount of derivative asset that is great like facebook they create a derivative asset of eyeballs that uh, come to facebook and then they monetize that with advertising so that's traction then key resources we all obviously said that you know how defensible is my business model okay so this is where you start talking about your ip your patterns or you talk about um, the kind of people that you have on your team and so on okay and then key activities so here you know you want to build a model where you can scale easily okay so tomorrow you know suddenly you know the the, the you, you know you have an opportunity to step on the gas you should be able to scale over here so you should not be limited by the kind by the activities that you perform okay for, uh, or you should not be limited um, uh, by the ability to ramp up uh, resources okay so your activities should be designed in such a way that they are highly scalable if not then you know you have some key partners who will help you make it scalable so key partners will provide you expertise they will provide you resources those are all required to uh, deliver your value proposition and then finally the costs okay because they will tell you what the margins are so if you saw the session that we had on unit economics it was trying to tie up the uh, revenue with the cost over there okay so you're trying to come to the concept of what we call as gross margin which is always a percentage okay so it's a gross profit upon uh, revenue is the uh, gross margin okay so we spoke of unit economics we spoke of cac ltv and so on so you know we, we we for a moment thought we have everything covered but risk is what is left when you think you have thought of everything okay so we are going to now cover those areas which we might have missed out or the areas where we are likely to struggle <clears throat> so i'm going to pick up this slide from uh, cb insights okay so earlier we used to say that you know most of the startups fail because there is no market need okay which is which is still true but 
of late, you know, we are seeing a lot of startups fail because they ran out of cash or they failed to raise new capital. Okay, so that's that's your that's your financial risk, right? So there are these various uh, reasons why a startup may fail, and you know, these are the risk elements that we want to address now. Okay, so you know, it's it's all very good uh, for us to talk about successful people. Okay, and you see, look, Facebook succeeded. Look at Airbnb; they succeeded. But actually, you should be looking at the failures and trying to fi figure out how they failed and why I should not fail there. Okay, so you want to understand those risks and understand how to address those. Okay, so let's begin with the value proposition. Okay, so this is your first risk. You know, I still see a lot of our startups are not able to articulate the value proposition very strongly. It should be. It should. It should resonate very well with your customers. You know, you should be able to substantiate it. You know, very strongly. So, your value proposition has to come out. And you know, if you people still are not able to craft your elevator page value proposition or your uh, taglines, you know, we can do a short session to take take all the startups of yours, and I will try to show you elevator pitches uh, samples for each one of them. Okay, we'll try to do that later. But why what is the value proposition risk if you don't get a value proposition right you know you will not be able to explain what your product does and you will not get people's attention okay so that's it you know you are you are flat dead if you cannot do that okay forget about the investors paying money and, uh, or investing money in you you know you will just not get anybody to listen to you so you need to have a strong value proposition so the whole idea is you know you may think you have a great idea Okay, but if it is not focused on the customer experience, okay, if it is not able to communicate to the customer how I simplify your world, okay, how I'm going to help you perform better, okay, then you know you have you have a challenge. So that is your biggest risk. So I I, I would urge you to go back, look at the look at the strong value proposition because that makes a lot of difference. Okay, make sure that the customer problem you are solving. Is not just for few customers, but it can solve the same problem for many customers. Okay, otherwise you won't have a meaningful business. Okay, so that's your first risk: the value proposition risk, or what we call as the product risk. The second risk that you have is the market risk. Okay, and the market risk. The whole idea here is to prove that you know you can make enough money and you can build a big business out of it. To prove that you know you have understood. The segment that you should be targeting, and that segment will be willing to buy your product. Okay, so if you are not able to do that, then you have you have a market risk over there. Okay, so timing is one other aspect of market risk. You know, so there are a lot of companies which are mistimed. You know, which 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 start when the time is not opportune. Okay, so there are there are great examples in Silicon Valley. The companies have raised two hundred, three hundred million dollars. Company like Webvan. Okay, and they failed completely. Okay, because the timing was incorrect. There were no smartphones. People were not willing to do online uh, grocery shopping and so on. Okay, and and come uh, a few years later, Instacart becomes um, a great unicorn, right? So your timing is also important. So that is another thing that we see in the market risk. You know, is your timing right? Okay, have you validated the urgency for your customer segment? Okay, have you validated their ability to pay? are they are they spending some money on this problem okay are they spending let's say 100000 on this problem and you can get some chunk of that then yes in then you have you you know you have addressed the market risk okay the other thing you know which i think vijay talile spoke about when he spoke about the market sizing is your market should be growing so typically people ask me you know what should be the growth rate of the market so if you come to me and say that market is going 5% 6% no value okay you have to look for markets that are growing at the rate of 20% or more okay and they will be interesting markets so what you do is you know you can you can uh, you can start focusing on markets or sub segments of the markets which are high growth areas okay and they will be good enough for you and say that okay you know this sub segment of the market that i'm focusing on on is uh, showing a growth rate of more than 20% although the whole market may be going only at 10% but that's okay right because that's your market 
then we come to what we call as the product market fit risk okay so this is a place where you are showing that there is something that i have made which the market will buy i have figured out how to take it to market i have figured out how to keep customers happy happy so that they stay engaged okay and i have this traction okay and traction speaks for product market fit okay so in a b2b version you know you have to show that you know i have so many letter of intents or i have so many paid pilots in progress and i have so many paid contracts so that is a good way to uh, show that you are uh, achieving your product market fit okay for a b2c version okay companies like even beep and so on you have to show that your user base is growing quickly okay through an affordable paid acquisition you are not spending fortune on acquiring these people but you have figured out some growth hack okay which is which is allowing your user base to explode through referrals and word of mouth so that will become critical okay so other aspect of product market fit obviously is to look at the engagement you know how how well people are engaged like i was talking to even beep today and they said people use our uh, application for at least 21 minutes a day that's a very very high engagement okay that means people are coming to their application daily and using it at least for 21 minutes on an average and that's 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 a significantly high engagement rate okay and obviously the churn has to be low the next uh, next risk area next risk area is your product quality risk okay this is you know are you able to make that product at all okay so you know are you able to build that product you remember we spoke about the feasibility right you know desirability feasibility and viability so i'm talking about the feasibility you know do you have the team that can build that product okay can you build a high quality product okay do you have an mvp is it good is it usable okay or do you have first version of a fully functioning uh, product so that's 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 the product quality risk okay so i think fortunately you know most of the startups in our uh, Uh, cohort except i can put finger on about two startups you know where you know they have to prove that they have the ability to build that product okay but otherwise um, the rest of the six have uh, have have some sort of capability to convince that you know the product quality risk is not very huge for them okay i would not name these two startups but you can guess but you know i will work with them and try to see that you know they are able to minimize that risk the other risk is the recruiting risk okay so this is one thing we look for in the founders that is the founder able to build a great team okay is he able to hire people okay and build his team effectively so if you either you have built so how do i de risk this you have built a strong team in the past okay or your core team has some great resumes okay great profiles in that okay or you have shown your ability to attract great talent through your personal charisma okay or your company vision is so powerful that people just want to work for you okay or you have an amazing work culture okay so you know there were some companies like sapos and so on they were built purely on work culture okay or something similar you know which will draw people to your company and say hey i want to work for you okay so that is that is that is a huge risk which people have and if you cannot build a good team if you cannot scale your team and if you cannot right find the right talent so you know so investors will certainly put their finger on this and try to watch this area the other risk is the partnering risk you know so are you able to build win win partnerships and leverage them to your benefit or to your advantage okay so this is where you know so you know after 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 a while you know i'm going to pause and try to pick some of this risks and you know we will do an interactive session uh, trying to understand how how this risk can be solved okay so strategic partnerships are great for a startup okay so they can provide you everything from an access to new markets or investment or eventually even acquire okay so you know a lot of the startups that um, you know in my portfolio that exited they exited because of great partnerships where the partners became the ultimate acquirers okay so you know if you remember in the in in very early sessions i said you know either you are building a viable startup or you are building uh, an an exit worthy startup 
for IPO, large scale startup or a social impact startup. So this is in the you know strategic partnership is very important for viable startups. Okay, so they can give you market access. And it is it is almost a requirement for most startups today to find a, a big brother, right? You know, to because the big brothers are always hungry because they are moving slow. Okay, they cannot move as fast as the startup, so they don't have the flexibility that you have. So they will always look for partnering with you, and then you will have access to uh, to their channels, you know, and to their customers. Okay, but. You know, when you try to force such partnerships, make sure that you have figured your product out completely. You know, you have figured out the customer experience because you know, otherwise, you know, you have only one silver bullet, right? You know, if they, if they find that you know, you your product uh, is 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 not at that stage where they should engage with you, then they will never never engage with you in future. So strong partnerships obviously will continue to evade you unless you have compelling value proposition or specific type of partnering that you want to go for. Okay, so either you are trying to fill a white space for a strategic partner, okay, in the product portfolio. So they have the product portfolio, you know, uh, and you say that okay, this portion is missing in your product portfolio, and because of that, you know, you are leaving money on the table, okay, and if you uh, take my product. Okay, it will help you complete your portfolio and it will add that revenue to you. Okay, this is the best uh, value prop pitch that you can provide to uh, to a partner. Okay, so you know, like for example, uh, go with you. You know, goes and says, "See, look, you know, you are leaving money on the table and not able to address the market in rural areas. You know, where there is no charging infrastructure. Without me, you cannot get to that market. And if you want to first move or advantage in that market, you know, partner with me, take my solution, add it to your vehicle, and uh, start capturing that market. You know. So, 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 so this is this is this is how." You know, you will be able to convince what we call as thousand pound gorillas, okay, to work with you because they are slow, so lethargic. You know, so 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 that's how you will you will convince them to work. The other other areas of partnership are obviously um, uh, platform uh, partnership with platform providers. For example, you know, you partner with somebody like uh, AWS, you know, Amazon Web Services for they have an IoT platform. And you're trying to build some IoT solution on their platform, they will be very happy to promote you because when they sell your product or they push your product to customers, their customers, their platform goes along with it. You know, so those kind of partnerships become really win-win. Okay. I wanted to spend more time on the partnership risk because you know, a lot of you are going to figure out that without a good partner, it will be hard for you to proceed further and, and capture the market. The next uh, risk is obviously the sales risk. Okay, that means you know, do you have the team that can sell your product effectively? Okay, so how do you how do you uh, how do you mitigate this risk from for an investor? Is either you have done a lot of sales in the past, okay, which is very similar to what this startup is going to do, or you have built and led very successful sales teams in the past, okay. Or you already have strong, experienced salespeople on your on your team. Okay, so that is how you will minimize the sale risk. And the same thing goes for marketing. You know, so all the startups may not require heavy-duty salespeople, but they will require this marketing wizards, right? So if you have people with that experience, absolutely, it will reduce. So it's read it as sales and marketing risk. Okay, basically the goal is successfully selling your product at a good price. Okay, with Good sales cycles, okay, with reasonable sales cycles. That means your sales cycle should not be uh, extremely long. That you have to wait for a lot of time uh, for your prospects to convert into customers. Then comes your financial risk. Okay, so this is so uh, this is this is again a very critical uh, risk. But here you have to prove that you have enough capital to reach the milestones that you need uh, to raise more money. Okay, so you have you have enough. Uh, money available, or you are able to generate the money through your revenues, and that you will not fail just because your funding is delayed by two three months. Okay, because that's that's a big risk uh, that the investors see. You know, can he raise money, and can he raise money quickly, or does he have a self-sustaining capability? Okay, 
So how much money does the company require to achieve its goal? Is the financing risk manageable given the current environment and the current company trajectory is what we will look for in the financial risk. So here, you know, how will you de-risk this? You have successfully raised some venture capital before. Great. OK, you have raised money from friends and families. Great. OK, that means you have the ability to go and ask for money. OK, and, you know, if you are not able to raise money, you know, you are generating, you will be able to generate enough revenue to sustain and do break even operations, you know, uh, until you raise additional capital. OK, so that is what they want to see. You know, it's not that, uh, you know, you have you have raised uh, money for nine months and suddenly, uh, you know, on nine month, ninth month, you run dry. And, uh, you know, if because, you know, the new investors who come in, some of them will obviously try to take advantage of the situation. OK, so they will see that this guy is running out of money. OK, so when they see that, they will try to delay their funding. OK, and they will try to delay their funding so that they can negotiate your valuation, number one, OK? Or they can negotiate their preferences, OK? So I will not talk about preferences in this session, but we will talk about it when we come to uh, startup valuations and funding. But they can negotiate the preferences, which can completely dilute you or reduce the money that you will take home on an exit, OK? And there are. There are very sad stories like that. So what they will try, to, some, some investors will come and tell you, I will give you a bridge loan, OK? And the bridge loan comes with all these caveats, OK? So which which which, which can be very risky for you, OK? Or they will say that, OK, you know, uh, wait for another two months, you know, your valuation seems high, and, and they will uh, try to run down your valuation. So, so show that, yes, I am able to sustain, you know, like, like I'll give you an example. Okay. I have, I have a company, um, you know, that's raising 7 million right now. The company has enough money, enough money to survive for another one year with the revenues that they are generating. So the founder is in no rush. Okay. He's sticking to his number on valuation and say that, you know, unless I get this valuation, I'm not going to take your money. You know? And usually when the founder says, okay, see, look, this is my valuation, take it or leave it. Okay. The investors come running after you. Okay. Because now they know that, okay, this guy, you know, may be able to raise money and I will lose this opportunity. And when they see that, you know, you have this, uh, this ability to stretch, uh, stretch yourself, you know, and not run dry, they, you know, so they, they, they really want to be in uh, backing you up on that. Then there are two other risks that we want to highlight. Okay, and this will also come out when we uh, start talking about uh, competitive analysis in our go-to-market strategy. Okay, so one is the short-term competition. Okay, so if you see in short-term competitive uh, risk, you know I have not considered the financial portion because in the early stages we tell the startups, you know, forget about the financial profitability or anything like that. Okay, go and build your business. Okay, so and you know, take care of your competition, show that you are differentiated from the existing players in the market. OK, so if if there are strong competitors already in the market, you know, what are the barriers to entry? How are you able to overcome? OK, if there are few uh, competitors and you have strong differentiation, OK, or if there are no competitors and there is high barrier to entry, which you have crossed, then you have taken care of the short term comp competitive risk okay because that's the first thing that you will target and then you will say okay you know i am cool okay i am settled now let me focus and try to make my uh, company profitable okay so 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 that's a short term risk and obviously the long term competition risk is uh, including your financials okay because because initially what happens is when you start when your competitors notice you Okay, in the short term area, they will ignore you. Okay, because they think that okay, I'm a thousand pound gorilla. Who is this uh, David? I'm a Goliath, right? So they will try start ignoring you. As you start building your business, as you start scaling, you know the same guys will come and uh, attempt to demolish you, attempt to um, run you down. Okay, so they will, you know, you will you will get into situations of price wars and all those kind of things okay unless you are able to keep strong differentiation over there okay so that's what happens 
so these are the 10 risks i have actually gone through 10 different types of risks okay and uh, how you can uh, look at them but the most important risk obviously is your execution risk okay which uh, we, which i mentioned in in the very first session also okay if you are not able to execute okay so your idea needs the right execution to build that into business okay so otherwise otherwise you know you you you'll, you'll not get there okay so with that you know what i'm going to do is i'm going to do some some uh, some interactive exchange of ideas on the different types of uh, risks over here okay so let's go around and uh, and 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 start start looking at different risks okay let's let me take the case of a market risk okay so if you find your market is very very competitive okay and you you find very hard to break in that market what will you do So this question is open to all the founders. What will you do if you find your market is very, very competitive? Like, for example, you know, if you look at the market of uh, Ventura learning management system, it's a very competitive market, right? There are a lot of people in that area. OK, so what has she got to do there? Uh, we should I think we should have a, a different uh, uh, differentiation in place which can make our product uh, self sustainable this is something we should we should have and uh, which can manje je amcha product am vegla banvel sagalyan pasun tevas amala te product entry medal ani tevas ami sustain hu shakto correct so ata ka asta maiti ek see when you with your differentiation also suppose this market is infested with lot of uh, competitors right Right. You will find hard to get an audience to listen to you. You will you'll find it very hard to find audience to listen to you. What will you do? OK, in that case, what we can do is we'll find where uh, uh, the existing customers are uh, looking for other LMSs. Like uh, exist, uh, if they are not happy with the uh, existing LMS or there is a need of uh, certain uh, uh, expertise or certain functions in the LMS that they are looking for or the uh, behavior analysis or as the, as everyone is looking for right now, which we have in our uh, LMS. So but, our but, 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 but you are you are an unproven product, right? You're just entering the market. Right. How, will, how, will, how will, you know, I'm not happy with my LMS, okay? And then you you tell me, okay, you, you go venture learning, this is the best thing on the earth. Why would I believe you, right? Uh, I can uh, I can show them a de data or analytics on uh, which basis. You do, I'm that, you do that data and analytics only when you have uh, some traction, right? Right. With the existing customer, we do have we have the uh, experience that they are looking for something. The uh, analytics we are providing right now. Right. So, 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 you know, uh, Aparna, you had asked me this question in one of the sessions earlier, you know, how do I partner, right? Yeah. What is the right way to partner? Okay. So that is another approach that you can take, you know, yeah, if you're able to find those right partners, you know, who can take you to those customers because you will need some backing. Okay. You are, you are a small company. Okay. When a, when a large company, because it's easy to convince that company with all these analytics that Tushar is talking about. And then yeah. when they see value in you, okay. And they see that you are offering them some sort of a white space which they are missing, okay, hmm. uh, which will help them uh, pick that money rather than leaving it on the table. So strategic partnership, you know, will be another area that you need to look at, Tushar. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think that will be the first thing we should actually do if we see a market risk, because then it's uh, our credibility plus the partner's credibility exactly. to get you know together, and then we pitch it accordingly. Exactly. So if, you know. Um, we count on that. So yes, correct, that's the correct. first thing. So what will what will happen? You know, there are some startups that I have seen. You know, uh, trying to do that Tam Sam Som analysis, and I found their uh, their market sizes to be very very small. Okay, mm -hmm. particularly their Som to be very small, the the Sam to be very small. Okay, and and so so when you when you see that the market that you have selected is not big enough, what will you do? Because that's a market risk, right? 
so you know i you know i see some some startup i'm not going to name the startup over here but if i see some startup which is show, showing me only 10 million in my song okay and showing me 20 million in my sam and showing me 150 million in my tam absolutely hard for you to get funding on these numbers okay so what what will you do how will you how so obviously you have to you have to broaden your uh, market right so what you're going to do is you're going to understand you know how can see this is this is again the pivot that you'll have to do you'll have to figure out you know how can i broaden my product so that it can address widen the market that i'm that i'm approaching okay for example you know if you are if you are looking at only India market, then say that, okay, how can I expand this into other geographies and try to attract that market also? Okay. So when, when you present that time, don't keep it India time, keep it a global time. Okay. And say that, yes, I have a way to get there. You know, the product that I'm building while I'm going to prove it in India I, is, is going to have a global, uh, it's going to have a global market. Okay. What happens if you find that? Yes, Sanjay. So you raised your hand. Um, yeah. Yeah. So whether to widen the market or other way around would be, or I mean, this is question, okay? Now I'm not suggesting anything. The question is find a market niche or find a certain market segment, which may be very small, okay? But it's a niche market. Is right. that the right approach or? Uh, no, no, you will always start. You're, 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 you're absolutely right. You will always start with a very, very niche market, okay? Mm -hmm. But that niche market is not good enough for investor. Okay. Oh, I see. Because the 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 multiples that the investor are looking are very high. Okay. When when we when we do our session mm -hmm. on uh, startup startup funding, mm -hmm. you will see how the investors think. Okay. I see. And this market sizes, you know, the niche market is great for you to start and get traction. Mm -hmm. But what is your big picture? Okay. Right. If once you have attached, uh, once you have uh, captured that niche market, how will you go? Okay. So. This is this is again uh, something that we should cover in a go to market strategy. What happens is there is something called as market penetration and there is something called as market expansion. OK, mm -hmm. so you need to think in those terms of how will you expand the scope? OK, not today. Today you want to be a niche, but how are you able to expand the scope so that the investor sees that? Yes, this guy is going after a two billion TAM. OK, this guy is going after a 500 a million uh, Sam. OK, and this guy is right now focused on something like a 30 million uh, SOM, you know, of which I'm sure that, you know, he will be able to grab and build a business of at least 15, uh, five, 5 million over the next three years. OK, so that's that is what they would like to see. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> so the other thing is, you know, uh, what happens if the decision making is very complex? Yes, Aparna, you have a question. Yes, so while we were doing this exercise of uh, Sam, Tam, uh, and Som, there was a question that came in mind that, you know, this 5 million and 7 million that we talk about, is it uh, supposed to be a yearly revenue or is it over a, a period of a certain number of years? See, what is what is Som? Som is the revenue, you know, you have to show that this is your revenue that you will be able to capture over the next three years. So it's the total. That's the market. That's the market you need to show there. Okay. And okay. it is not possible that you will be able to acquire the entire SOM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, if you remember, Vijay Tadele said that you might be resource constrained. Yeah. Okay. So if you're resource constrained, you know, your SOM is big, but I'm resource constrained. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the investor wants to see, yes, the SOM is big. This startup is resource constrained, has attraction. Let me put money and remove those resource constraints. Okay. Okay. See, that's why all these things that we are talking, unit economics, Sam's, uh, Tam Sam Song, they're all very important for you to make your startup fundable, okay, mm -hmm. and present it properly to the investors. Okay. Let's move, let's move to uh, finance, okay? And, uh, you know, means I've been uh, seeing some companies. What happens, you know, if you have, if you need very large funding to build your technology, what will you do? You know, you have a great idea, okay, uh, and you need you need you need big investment to fund that uh, to fund building that. You know, what will you do? So obviously, you know, unless somebody has an answer, you will build a smaller version, 
of that okay so it's it's always like that okay so that's the niche which sanjay wardge was talking about okay you will go for that niche you will go with the smaller version you will go with you know we have different terminologies okay you know mvp used to validate but you know there is something called as an msp we call it a minimum saleable product okay or we call mmp minimum marketable product okay or there is also a new term which has come up called a mlp which is minimum loveable product okay so you know you you need to get there like for example you know we were talking um, uh, go with you right you know i was just having a chat with them and you know we suggested that they take a step wise approach okay and get to their big vision so that is what that is what you need to do what if the customer lifetime value is low what will you do so you know your customer lifetime value is low your cac is very high okay and the cost cost of customer acquisition is very high you are not able to get that ratio of 3 you know you are struggling around 1 which is which is a no go for an investor what will you do the answer is a simple so probably so, you know the, what i'm trying to do through this exercise is you know you know showing you you know how what are the things that will run through your mind when you come across such risks and how you should be thinking in those terms right and you should really think through this risks you know uh, and and how will you address them jaydeep jaydeep has a question no so so i was trying to answer your uh, query what will we do so so maybe we'll have to look at a new customer rather than rather than investing our time and effort on the said customer uh, because because then then the entire premises of our model will go for a toss if customer lifetime value is is not meeting the the investable requirement correct so there are there are yeah, you are absolutely right so you will find the right customers who are with the willingness to pay to deliver the lifetime value that you are expecting absolutely right okay the other option that you will have obviously is to find a way to lower your cac okay so the current channel that you are using may not be the correct channel right for example you know you might be using direct sales channel to go and talk to these people okay can you use alternate channels okay can you do some uh, some inbound and outbound a combination of that you know you remember i spoke of inbound outbound also right in the sales strategies okay so can you do a combination of that so you will you will you will deeply look at you know if if the cost of customer acquisition is high that means my channel cost is high okay so i have to look at two things you know my selling process and my marketing process okay and and try to figure out you know how do i lower that and start experimenting with different channels okay and obviously this this again you know uh, is an area of go to market you know how how to pick the channels okay so we have covered earlier uh, you know the various ways that you can do it but there are there are there are about 19 channels that we talk about okay very very clearly defined 19 channels okay so i will i will share some notes samir with you you know and we can cover yeah. those 19 channels i'll, I'll share some notes with you. certainly yeah looking forward yeah so let's let's look at uh, the uh, i have i have one more question here okay that is your profit margin is expected to be low okay you are not saying not saying good profit margin so unit you you see alankar spoke about gross margin right the other day okay your your gross margin you know over 3 years time also your gross margin is not going up so there are certain there are certain percentages we look for in gross margin okay and depending on the nature of the company okay if you are a saas company there are different percentages you know if you are a company like jaydeep that will be different percentage you know if you are um, if you are an enterprise uh, startup you know there'll be uh, providing enterprise solution there are different percentages okay so but but effectively if you find that your gross margin itself is not getting to a positive level at all okay and and remains low then what will you do yes saurabh so we'll try to uh, scale it up Uh, we try to increase the sales or volumes as much as possible 
correct so you are you are talking about i'll try to get to economy of scale correct yeah okay so there is something else that you will do before getting to economy of scale it's very simple the answer is very simple aparna you want to ask answer you raised your hand you are muted so probably we could slice the solution in different uh, uh, pricing uh, slabs so we know that uh, one pricing slab is uh, more profitable and which could cover for a, a, a market segment that's giving less profit yeah but the the mood question is you know what the, the the question is like this you know your profit margin is itself is low okay whether you whether you slice and dice whatever you do the profit margin itself is low so the question the answer is very obvious you know you you, you have to absolutely look at your cost and how will you reduce the cost very simple okay so so all the answers to the risk questions are very very simple but what happens is sometimes you know our mind becomes very complex in its thinking and we we miss out on these simple things okay so obviously you will drill down what is my cost why am i not profitable okay how do i rush down so you know we used to do this exercise a lot you know when we when we built a company and we would go through all the cost bases and we would we would come up with a number saying that you know my ebitda has to increase by so much so next this is next year's target very simple okay so how do we get so we would do this entire spreadsheet analysis and say that okay you know i need to cut i need to bring this cost you know by so much percentages and those are the targets we would hand out to people okay hr this is your target to bring down this cost you know uh, sales this is your target you know uh, inventory this is your target and so on so you can you you set your your uh, kras you know um, based on that okay or one, i think now they call them okrs and all that so you will set them based on that okay so one 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 last one i'm going to take and that is on the team okay your team has no entrepreneurial experience at all okay what will you do that's a big risk for an investor and your answer is right here <laughs> partner with incubators like you and seek mentors partner yeah not not, not me you you have strong mentors over here right get mentors partner with the... them partner with them and you know you know carry your relationship you know you you want to pick up the right mentors right advisors you know whose resume will be valuable uh, to you okay so if you are in the banking you know pick those people from banking areas you know who will be very interesting pick people from cdb okay who will be interesting from you pick people from the uh, some the, uh, you have this uh, cooperatives on the rural, rural banks and all that pick some of those people you know who will add their glamour to your team okay so that is important pick good advisors pick good so this is this is very critical right now okay for all of you and uh, just not your founding team but your advisory team at least two people minimum two people you should try to get and, and you know so you know you, you can you can like uh, for example this guy uh, what's his name go vidyut right go vidyut has this uh, have they have two brilliant mentors actually uh, soman and uh, sanjay okay yes. so sanjay sanjay is like a guru in uh, in iot area right so he 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 is going to be really helpful to you guys okay when you, when you are trying to uh, struggle with that logic right or you know uh, uh, chinmay okay i think he has he has some good entrepreneurial experience to back you up you know so pick pick some people you know before you talk to investors you know show your ability to onboard some good advisors okay so that will that that will be required okay so great so i'm going to i'm, I'm going to restart uh, this uh, presentation and i'm going to go further so what we have done so far is we have looked at risks which are internal to the business model okay and if you remember on the first session i spoke of risks which are external okay so i'm going to um, briefly talk about those risks over here you are able to see my screen yeah. yes okay so this is this was a slide i presented on in the first session right you know your business model you have taken care of you have looked at the risks in your business model but look at the external factors that could really impact your business model so here we have what is called as a 
Porter's five forces analysis that people do generally. And this is a nice uh, model that was developed by uh, Professor Michael Porter in Harvard Business uh, School. Okay. And the, the five frameworks are, you know, when you look at your business model, say what happens if my customer starts bargaining with me? Okay. So, you know, you're depending on that customer for your recurring revenue. Now the customer says, you know, see, look, I'm not going to renew my contract with you unless you give me this discount. And this has, this happens. Okay. So you need to understand, you know, how much of bargaining power that the company customer can have? What, what if I terminate that service? What will the customer do? Okay. Terminating the service certainly is not a good solution. Okay. Because you do not want to create that, uh, draw that line between you and the customer, but how will it inconvenience him? And that will tell you how much bargaining power that customer has. Okay. Then there are always this threat of substitutes that will come up, you know, new products will come up, which will, which can just uh, throw your product away. So you need to always be on a vigil to, to look at this uh, substitutes or the new entrants that are coming in. Then the partnership, as it is a good thing, it is also a risky thing. Okay. When it comes to buy, buy, sell, uh, buyer, supplier, supplier, buyer partnership that you have formed. Okay. If you depend completely on one supplier, like, like this has happened now for some of the electronics manufacturer, you know, they were depending on one company in Taiwan and that company is running through some problems and, you know, everybody's trying to figure out, you know, uh, you know, you know, we have put too much dependence, you know, you put all eggs in that basket, you know, you don't want to do that. Okay. So you, you know, you look at that supplier and you will try to have alternate sources of supply also. Okay. Initially, as a small startup, you may not be able to do that. But moment you start evolving, you should start looking at that. And then the uh, competition, right? Internal competition is between the competition between uh, your 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 competitive uh, companies, right? Who, who will compete with you? Okay, so there can be that this can turn into a rivalry, and it can be a very vicious rivalry, where you know they just to throw you out of the account. You know they will try to do things. So you need you need to start looking at you know, if something like this happens, how am I going to deal with it? Okay. Then there is also this analysis and, you know, I don't want to, you know, I will just throw it here. You can Google pestle analysis and you will know it is called pestle because it is political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal, you know, what are the legal risks? You know, what are the political risks? Suppose the government changes. There are a lot of startups depend on that, right? What happens? The government changes. What happens if the economic tanks, you know, so the the, the 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 social aspects, you know, your demographic changes and all that, you know, those are social aspects, right? So I will I will take some uh, examples over here, okay? Demographic trends, okay? So I will take some example of what do, what do I mean by that? Like aging population, okay? In Japan, you know, the aging population is increasing, okay? Or in a country like India, the Gen Z, Gen Z population, which is the very very young people who think very differently. Okay. So we have different product, different ideas of using a product, you know, how do we, um, you know, address that risk, you know, that, uh, you know, if, if, if the aging population increases, what happens to my product or if the Gen Z population comes in, you know, what is its impact on my product and how do I deal with it? Right. Then the customer needs, okay. I'll take an example of dependence on digital. Okay. So now, you know, a lot of these brick and mortar uh, businesses, consumer businesses have to shift to online businesses, right? Like e-commerce. Okay. Because, you know, the, 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 the newer generations and because of the pandemic, you know, the shift has been to digital and there's a lot of dependence on digital, so, you know, so they have to figure out how they're going to do that. So this is, this is another kind of risk that, that you will encounter in the business. Then the technology risk. Okay. So what happens? You know, uh, like 5G is pushing robotics now, right? So a lot of things will get automated. Okay. So if things get automated, what happens to my business? Okay. And, um, you know, uh, so, so, so new uh, technology trends like, you know, uh, computer vision, you know, um, AR, VR, all these kind of things that are coming, how does it impact my business? For example, you know, uh, what what Mercedes did was they have this thick user manual, right? Mercedes Benz. Okay, so they have provided now a VR experience on the manual. Okay, so you can go 
with 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 the with the VR glasses, and you can actually open your manual by 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 looking at different parts in the car itself. Okay, so competition. Okay. So competition, what happens is you will start suddenly seeing that some uh, some of your competitors are trying to form some bond or alliance, OK? Or some there is a lot of acquisition that is happening, a lot of partnering that is happening. You have to keep your eyes and ears open for that, OK? Because if you know they are trying to form a formidable force, right, uh, to, to counter you, and you, know, you need to be aware of that, that you know, these are the uh, these are the mergers or partnerships that are happening that I should I should try to find a partner for myself, you know, who can be a formidable formidable competition for the others. Then there are regulatory issues that are happening, right? Like facial recognition is a no-no over here, right? You know, you cannot, you know, there, there is a lot of privacy issues on, on facial recognition, particularly in the United States. Or you look at the GDPR, right? The, the data privacy regulations that are there. OK, so because of the data privacy regulation, you know, I earlier, you know, we used to have data coming from Europe directly. Now it cannot. OK, you have a problem that data needs to stay there. OK, it needs to go on a separate cloud. It cannot be on your cloud over here. So there are those issues and those risks. So if you are dealing with customers outside and there is a data privacy regulation that does not allow you to service that customer, then you need to look into that. Or economy, okay. There is recessionary behavior, right? People start curtailing, like like uh, hospitality, you know, suffered. Okay, so you know, will your business suffer, you know, with with the recessionary trend or behavior that you're seeing now? Okay, or environmental, you know, if your product is not see now, you know, a lot of new products which are coming, you know, they are made from recyclable material or reusable material, or they are used from organic substances, or they're used organic dyes and and so on okay and the newer generation absolutely loves this uh, thing you know so they have and particularly in the us okay so they want a company to have eco friendly products you know sustainability is very high on their agenda okay they are very concerned about climate change and all that you know so is your product you know does it carry this risk you know you need to see that so and and certain uncertainties right what happens if Something like pandemic continues now for another six months. Okay, so will I be able to survive or will I not be able to survive? So think through this, think through these various risks, and you know, you know, I will uh, share a spreadsheet like this with you. You know, make a list of your risk categories. Okay, the more the the more the better. Okay, so so put every every risk down there, and see the level of risk that you carry. Okay, is it a critical risk? Is it a high level risk, low level risk? Okay. And describe that risk and uh, figure out your risk mitigation strategy. That if this happens, this is how am I going to deal with it? Or I already have this high risk right now. And this is what I put in place so that you know my business does not suffer. Because investors will ask you certainly, you know, what happens if there are two other competitors offering the same product, they jump in, you know, who are much bigger players than you are. Okay. So what is your strategy for mitigating that? Okay, or they might they might say that okay, okay, your product is is really nice and good, but you know in few years time, you know the the entire uh, customer needs are going to change. Okay, what customers are doing manually now they are going to do digitally. Okay, tomorrow. So how does a business handle that? So for this, there is a very simple grid that I will show you. Okay, which can help you decide on the risk level impact okay so it is not just you will just say this is critical this is high this is low or something like that you will look at the risk likelihood is this risk likely okay if the risk is not likely then you can tell the investor see look this is not a likely risk and if it happens this is my mitigation strategy okay or if the risk happens very frequently so risk frequency so you put risk frequency on your y axis and you put the impact of this risk okay what impact will this risk have? Okay, so is it high, medium, low? All this critical, you will get through this three by three matrix. We'll be able to um, articulate that and put this. So now you know you have you have science behind uh, you know cat you know uh, specifying your risk levels. Okay, so you look at those risk levels and decide on the mitigation strategy. 
And based on that, and this is going to be very useful because all these questions will come up when you start uh, going for fundraising. I think we are just right on the top of the hour. So over to you, Anna. 